Okay. So, well, good evening, Gay, and welcome to Wellington, New Zealand. And Thank you. So, I'm just starting the recording and I'll just sort of welcome, give you a formal welcome, which won't be a, what we say, a karaoke, a proper English welcome. So, from your home in Devon, Gay Watson, you're going to be speaking to us briefly on the topic of emptiness, its importance in Buddhist thought, its relationship to mindfulness and meditation, and its relevance and appearance in contemporary Western culture. So I've told them that you're looking forward to our question your, and comment at the end of the talk, and that you are a friend and a psychotherapist and have a PhD in religious studies from SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. You're a writer, and your most recent book is called Buddhism and dot, dot, dot. Intriguing. So your website is at gaywatson.com and there's a link to the paper you presented to the 2013 Secular Buddhist Colloquium in Barry, Massachusetts, which was titled Some, brackets, mostly secular, close brackets, thought about emptiness. And that's on the One Mindful Breath website on the event page for today's session. So um, thank you very much. And I will just, I'll switch off our microphone for now and say over to you, Gay. Thank you very much. Um, I am old enough to be absolutely astonished that I, sitting here rather too early in the morning for me in Devon, can be talking to you in your evening in New Zealand. It, it is a complete wonder. Um, I also live fairly remotely in the countryside, and I did lose the little blips when I, you were talking, Ramsey, so I do hope this will come through to you without too much problem because my internet is hideously slow. Um, I also realized that I should probably have called this talk a gallop through emptiness in a way to attempt such a subject, you know, in, in, in such a short time is uh, probably, I could only say faintly bonkers. Um, so why did I do it? One, because I think it is almost unique to Buddhism, except for, for Taoism, is at the absolute center of Buddhist thought. Um, and also, I'm terribly fond of the concept. Um, I'll start with a story that many years ago, some, I don't know, can't remember how many, um, I was in what you could call almost the empty heart of America. And right in the middle of the Navajo Nation, near Lake Powell, and on a Sunday deserted plaza in a Wi-Fi cafe, I picked up some communications with the rest of the world I'd rather happily left behind a couple of days before, and picked up an email from a friend who said that a publisher friend of his was looking for someone to write a book called a philosophy of emptiness and he thought of me and wondered if I was interested. Um, remembering when I wrote my thesis that my supervisor had accused me of being obsessed with emptiness, I thought this one was for me. So I quickly sent off a little email saying, yes, yes, I'm very interested, but I'm in the middle of nowhere. Please may I come back to you? Um, in a week's time, and then went off and spent the most wonderful afternoon in the most beautiful empty canyon I have ever seen in my life. Well, I did write that book eventually, even though the publishers said to me, we do not want a Buddhist book. So I said, well, as long as you'll let me say that, you know, emptiness is unique to Taoism and Buddhism, and that Buddhism has without doubt the most well-worked-out philosophy of emptiness, sure, I'll go hunting for emptiness anywhere you like, which I did. So that's really a lot of my interest in it, in, in various perhaps unusual places. Um, but back to Buddhism. What does emptiness refer to? Um, 
the name of the translation we use is perhaps unfortunate because if you say emptiness to anybody they just think it means lack nothing negation and really that is not what it's about the actual word shunyata in sanskrit etymologically has some connotations of a seed bursting open um we've tried other people have tried other 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 um translations the worst i think is void and the void which i find deeply upsetting um and there have been nothingness um i remember working with stephen batchelor on when he was doing his his um wonderful translation of nagarjuna from which i will quote later called versus and then gave it up um i don't know what would work openness probably is the nearest to me but it wouldn't work as a translation so we are left with emptiness so what is this emptiness what are we thinking of something being empty of because i do think it's almost always useful in buddhist terms to think of things if we can in terms of verbs and not in terms of nouns so what is something empty of it is the emptiness of intrinsic independence that is revealed by that other pillar of buddhist thought dependent origination or co-arising this i think is absolutely the heart of dharma the buddha once said one who sees dependent origination sees the dharma and much more recently the dalai lama the current dalai lama has referred to dependent origination as the general philosophy of all buddhist systems what is it well in its very simplest form it is given in the sutras as as like this when this exists that comes to be with the arising of this that arises when this does not exist that does not come to be with the cessation of this that ceases there are of course much more complex descriptions of it but that is fundamentally what it is things are interdependent and the first of the four truths or let us call them after stephen the four tasks what is to be known is the sorrow or the unsatisfactoriness that arises due to impermanence change non-self and i suppose inevitably um death um and emptiness is but or but is wonderfully the other side of a coin of dependent origination one side of the coin explains how everything is interdependent the other side says because of this everything is empty of its own intrinsic independence because it is dependent on this rich network um nagarjuna who is the poet and the philosopher of emptiness wrote and this is stephen's translation where he i think rather wonderfully translated dependent origination as contingency nagarjuna said contingency is emptiness the two are unsplittable now in early buddhism the emptiness really referred to that emptiness of self um the not self um later on in mahayana buddhism the idea of emptiness was expanded to include all phenomena now i think 
in terms of the self, it's quite interesting with my psychotherapist hat on. It does make sense. So many people come into psychotherapy because they, they are clinging to an identity, an identity that may well have been instilled in childhood. I think we all know that when we're children, you take up a position often in the family. You are the clever one, the stupid one, the helpful one, the difficult one, all these things. And we build up almost unknowingly an identity around it. Later on in life, when our circumstances have hugely changed, this identity, if we totally identify with it, gets in the way. It prevents us from changing along with changing circumstances. It causes sorrow. It causes it help it gets in the way of resilience. Um, so that's the not self, but the Mahayana applied this to all phenomena. They said everything Art Sutra tells us form is emptiness emptiness is form and everything is empty because it is its existence is dependent on causes and conditions the relationship of parts and wholes and sometimes our very designation in language because our language it is our language that divides things up in order that we may maneuver our way through this what um, uh, the philosopher and psychologist William James calls the blooming buzzing confusion of life and yet things as we if we look carefully are more complex than the way our language separates them and individuates them and this is where Buddhism is concerned with practice, with a way of living, not with theory. Um, you know, I think we all know the story of the, the, the Buddha told about the arrow, the man who has been shot with an arrow who comes in and everyone rushes around saying what kind of arrow, where was it, who did it, why? And he says, let's get the arrow out. He is concerned, was concerned with how to live, how to evade sorrow and pride, fear, anger. Um, having said which, I have to admit that Buddhist philosophy can actually outdo that medieval Western philosophy that used to argue how many angels can be seen on the head of a pin. Um, there is incredibly complex um, models. I'm sure you've come across them. The seven of this, the nine of that, the 12 of that, the five of this. And I think they can often be off-putting. But what is helpful, I think, is to remember that they are all models of process. They are all models that are trying to break down intrinsically independent objects and present them in the dynamism of their becoming. They present psychophysical being as a dynamic changing process. And I think this is really helpful to remember when one gets thrown with these rather complex models often and again this leads to practice because i think the way the buddha discovered all of this and certainly the way he left the teachings for us to follow was revealed in mindfulness and meditation by taking time out well, first, I think we just discover we're not in charge, that um, our, our minds ceaselessly, monkey mind is climbing up the trees when we think we should be sitting there being incredibly serene. But we see how these thoughts 
often unwanted, rise and cease. And that's what we're told to look for, the rising and the ceasing. Things rise and things cease. And perhaps after lots of practice or perhaps sometimes as a gift, moments of clarity come through. When the narrative, the stories, our desires of the ego drop away. And what is left is not nothing but a greater openness. To go back to Nagarjuna, something Nagarjuna wrote again, when emptiness is possible, everything is possible. Where emptiness is nothing would be possible. So we might find in mindfulness and meditation a rest from grasping, grasping an important link in one of those long series of explaining dependent origination, away from grasping identities, beliefs, desires, and objects, and views, above all views. The only sutra that um, Nagarjuna quotes from <clears throat> in his um, verses on emptiness is that he says, is one in which he says, the Buddha rejects both it is, <clears throat> excuse me, and it is not. And we'll come back to that because I'm galloping on, but why do I think emptiness is so important? One, I do believe it tells us a great deal about the nature of mind. And I think it is hugely helpful in our Western world because it presents us <clears throat> with a logic of complementarity that is very different from the logic of either or, of contradiction, of the, the exclusion of the middle that we have inherited without even thinking about it. And I think it is, provides an escape, a middle way from the dualities, the conflicting dualities of so much of Western thought. It allows us to think is and is not together. Um, absence and presence become linked, not inevitably opposed. Um, I think it, it brings us to, I don't know if any of you come across um, that wonderful term that the poet John Keats used. Um, in, in, in his, he wrote in a letter about negative capabilities. And the, I'll, I'll read you what he wrote. Where negative capability, where a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reacting, sorry, any irritable reaching after fact and reason. I think that's a rather wonderful place. Um, and the poet um, T.S. Eliot also wrote, except for the still point, there would be no dance. I think artists, after I wrote my book on emptiness, I went on to write one about attention because I found that in my trawls through looking for um, emptiness in the contemporary world, that I found it uh, quite easily in the field of the arts. And I found that those artists, writers, dancers, sportsmen too, um, who understood the concept of emptiness, often came to it. Some of them 
had had practice in, in, in Buddhism or Eastern religions and practices. Others had absolutely none at all. And they came through it, I thought, through mindfulness, through the practice of attention to their craft or their arts. Um, and when I asked friends initially, what does emptiness mean to you? Most of them gave me a sort of negative answer, lack, loss. But when I asked two artist friends, the sculptor immediately said, oh, the space around the form. And the painter said, oh, the space around the image, the figure and the ground. So I think that's what emptiness can give us, that richer understanding of the ground and the figure. It is not either or, it is both and. Um, a linking of an absence that is emptiness. So I once wrote a paper called The Abundance of Emptiness. <laughs> it allows us to touch, as, as Keats said, the mysteries, the paradoxes, the complexity of life. So at the end of my gallop, I'm just going to end by quoting from two poems. Um, one is a 20th century American, and the other is 8th century Chinese. And I think both of these embody emptiness. Um, the American poet Wallace Stevens wrote a poem quite well known called The Snowman, and this is a little bit from it. He writes of the listener who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and the nothing that is. And then um, some, hang on, 12th century, blah, 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 eight, nine, no, can't do my math, six, seven centuries earlier, um, the Chinese poet Tu Fu wrote, here spring colors float beyond peaks. Star River fills meditation hall shadow. Sunbright absence transmits the lamp. Yellow gold presence reveals the earth. Thank you very much for listening. Um, now I'd be interested to know if, if any of that <laughs> spoke anything to you. Well, um, thank you, Gay. That, that was, personally, that was wonderful. Um, we're going to throw it over to the floor. If anybody has a question, go and approach the screen so that, don't forget, the camera is that little green dot at the bar. So you can look at the camera and then the comment or question is the name of your most welcome. Who wants to go first? While other people think of questions, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to say that that was really interesting. Thank you. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. It was it was rather a lot compressed into a small space, I think. But thank you. You all listened so beautifully. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, my name is Alex. I have a question. In terms of how emptiness, I, I suppose one thing with with secular Buddhist practices is often concerned with how things. Uh, how your practice influences your day-to-day -day life, the actual act of being alive. And I wondered about how your uh, views around emptiness and the realizations that you've had for many years, it sounds like, of studying emptiness, how they've changed the way in which you live your day-to-day -day life. That's such a good question. And I wish I could ask, answer it perhaps in a more wholehearted manner and it is a question that sometimes you know i won't pretend to have the best practice in the world but when i am sitting and occasionally i will recite the beginning of the heart sutra to myself form is emptiness 
emptiness is form. And a little voice does say to me exactly what you have just said. Okay, and how does that affect you when you're running around the supermarket in the middle of the day? How does that accept, affect you when you are trying, you know, to keep your patience with a grandchild? Um, I wish I had a really good answer. And yet, I think if I am honest, it gives me more space. I think it does help me to get a little less twangled up in the narratives, the emotions of the moment. You know, it, 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 is, it is like being able to do a little um, figure ground reversal occasionally bigger picture that this too will pass the rising the falling the the coming into being the ceasing i do think it it probably as as one who all my life has had very little patience um i think it has helped that's really all i can say but i think it has at a sort of a deep level you know i i think I remember being thrown in when I was doing my doctorate and my supervisor said, well, of course, you must have a little um, practice of teaching. Go and teach um, the MA class um, dependent origination. And it might have been emptiness then. And it was all new to them. I don't think Buddhist studies were their major. And so I... I remember uh, talking about not self, that's right, it was not self. And they all said, you know, this seems counterintuitive. And I said, well, I find that some of these Buddhist models, you sort of understand them on the drip feed. It's like water gradually, gradually wearing away a stone or the feet making the little um, pathways, um, you know, up the stairs, the, the desire lines that people make the paths of where they tread. And then one day it does make sense. <laughs> That's all I can say. Comments, questions, observations? Brick bats, bouquets. <laughs> you can wrong tomatoes and no tomatoes, right? Then I would be glad of the screen. <laughs> so so again, this is this is Ramsey here, and I have a quick observation question observation. You talked about not self. Yes, in some Buddhist and other uh, Eastern tradition, they talk about no self. Can you comment on the difference? Well, I wish I would, but I always get muddled up because I remember, I think I put no self into something and somebody corrected me. And I always forget whether it's not self or non-self, but I think no self means you don't have a self at all. And I think this is, I disagree with this. Of course, we have what we may call a self. It all goes down to what? we call a self. And that's where I get back to this intrinsic independence. Um, we don't have an independent self. We have narratives. We have a physical embodiment. Um, I think it's interesting that without doubt, neuroscience today, though it speaks in an incredibly different language, is actually saying exactly what Buddhism said or the Buddha said all those, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. It isn't a self as we think of one. Now, I think the no self doctrine possibly had its historical origins as, as a response to the Vedic Atman, you know, theory. It was, this is what Buddhism was 
um, it, it's 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 antagonistic doctrine, if you like, of of the time it came into being. So it was definitely distinguishing itself from this sort of feeling of you know you have this intrinsic little inner self or soul that will join the greater later and i think buddhism was very distinctly anti that um and the self like everything else is dependently originated you know forms feelings perceptions dispositions and consciousness um the psychophysical model of being that is divided up it's it's process but i think if you say no self it makes it too too difficult because let's face it you, we have to remember that somewhere in the sutras it is things for those of sound mind and body well not so much body but certainly sound mind and we know that if you lose altogether a sense of self you're not in a happy place. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments, observations? No? No? So yes or no? No? Okay. <laughs> Go on. Go on. So I just wanted to say, um, I, uh, I haven't got a question, but um, I, uh, but I'm to, um, I, like um, others here, um, are taking a great interest, and it's my first talk on emptiness, and and it's a hard to grasp the subject. So it um, is. listening, and the next time we have another talk on emptiness, we will be better prepared. So I, yeah, we are interested. Thank you very much. I you know I I did think it was a a, a rather um. A, a rather sort of deep dive in the deep end of the pool to do this but um i do think that that emptiness is is not that hardly hard to understand if it comes with dependent origination and i do think that this model of how the world worlds in this wonderful Indra's net of interconnection is something that is very special and very unique to Buddhism. And I think it is very important. And I do think, um, going back to Alex's question, I think it does help in one's life. And, you know, hopefully it does make sense in those little glimpses one might get in mindfulness and in meditation. Thank you. Well, look, I'm going to say on behalf of all of us here, thank you, Gay. Uh, and your talk is going to be up on the internet very soon. So we'll hopefully we'll talk about and lots of people. We hope from all over the world will be able to see that you spoke on this night to uh, One Mindful Breath here in Wellington, New Zealand, all the way from Devon or Cornwall? Devon, Devon. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, 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 and thank you very much. I think it's been wonderful. Uh, and, and as a group, we have all, we, we enjoy the range of talks that we get. We have evenings, which is very basic, introductory things. And we also have evenings such as tonight, where we go into things into depth. And all these, all of it is useful. Good, good. Um, well, it's, it's all part of the sort of wonderful net of Indra, isn't it? It's all linked up somehow. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you had, a good, you had a meal with Stephen the other night, haven't you? I did, yes. Um, I had a very nice lunch with Stephen and, uh, oh no, he came here. Um, but before that with him and John Peacock, I don't know if he has spoken to you. Um, you wanted to pin down, should we say? Okay, yes. Well, Stephen is very well and uh, gone back to France uh, for Christmas. <laughs> very good. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And I will stop the recording and we'll say thank you again. For all of us thank here. you. Thank you. And thank you for being such a very nice audience. And a very happy Christmas and New Year to you all. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.